local actors play a crucial role before, during, and after disasters. They are the first responders because of their access to the affected communities, their understanding of local cultural context, and of course, cost effectiveness. They also play a key role in both recovery and long-term sustainable development. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on promoting localization through multi-stakeholder partnerships. Organized by ADPC or the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, serving as a secretariat of the Asian Preparedness Partnership or APP, this session will exhibit how innovative multi-stakeholder partnerships in the Asian region are promoting locally led actions to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. It will also show how the enabling environment for localization supports and aligns to the key global frameworks, as well as to the transformation of the humanitarian ecosystem. Another important focus area for this session will be on the important role that multi-stakeholder partnerships play in supporting COVID-19 preparedness and response efforts in Asian countries. I am Edwin Salonga of the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, serving as its country program manager for the Philippines, and I'll be your moderator for this session. I hope that you're all safe and well. We are fortunate that today we are joined by a distinguished panel of experts who will share their insights and experiences on the promotion of localization through multi-stakeholder partnerships. I'll be introducing them one by one. And the first is Ms. Pilar Pacheco, a senior program officer of the Emergency Response Global Development Division of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are also joined by Mr. Irfan Mufti, a member of the Central Executive Committee of the National Humanitarian Network. He is also serving as Deputy Director of the South Asia Partnership Pakistan. Ms. Veronica Gobaldon is from the private sector. She is the Executive Director of the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation. Another dignitary that we are very proud to be here today is Mr. Muhammad Mosin. He is the Secretary of the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief of the Government of Bangladesh. Concurrently, he is also serving as the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. And to round up our distinguished panel of experts, we have Mr. Cicera Madura Peruma, the Director for the Preparedness for Response and Recovery Department of the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. I hope that you are all excited to join us today in this wonderful session on promoting localization through multi-stakeholder partnerships. And I would like to pose the first question to Ms. Pilar Pacheco of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Why is it important really to invest in localization? So Ms. Pilar. Thank you, Edwin. And if you can stop sharing, I can share my screen. Um, as I'm doing that, I just wanna thank everyone uh, for the invitation to um, participate in this uh, panel. Uh, of a topic that is very close to the work that the Gates Foundation does, uh, particularly from the emergency response team, but something that has been uh, more and more being uh, a topic that runs across the foundation in general, especially um, as of last year, more so as of last year, because of the importance of uh, local actors in the COVID response. So I'm gonna start by sharing a couple of quotes uh, the first one is by someone who inspired us throughout his life, and he does so still today. Um, because this quote about, uh, you know, having a vision um, and, and, and the importance of, of action to change the world is something that speaks to me, particularly when I think about uh, localization. And I'd like to contrast it with another quote from somebody that many of you know very well and who has been in, uh, in an earlier session today, uh, Ms. Uh, Dig and Ali. And it's 
you know, the first quote, if, if you remember Mandela's words, you know, they call us to action, vision, it's, it's somewhat hopeful. However, um, Ms. Degan Ali, she's, she has a very realistic approach and which is something that I, that I really appreciate and value of her words. And, and you know, and as a donor, as a perspective of the donor, it calls me at least, and, and those of us who work in this field as donors to, to question ourselves and to question our actions. Are we, is localization just the nice thing to do and the catchphrase that we're all using? Or are we really trying to instill change? So my approach to answering the question, Edwin, will be in two parts. I'll talk a little bit about current trends, um, especially around humanitarian needs, the funding, how funding uh, is uh, uh, allocated to local organizations, local actors. And then I'll talk a little bit about why I think it's important and we think it's important to uh, invest in local actors. So, the, what you see here on the screen, this is uh, not news to anybody. This uh, OCHA has already estimated the, the, the tremendous amount of people that will need humanitarian aid in 2021 and the funding gap that there is, which is pretty conser considerable. If we look back at information um, from also from the Global Humanitarian Assistance Report, you'll see that from 2018, there, most of the donor governments, the big OECD uh, governments, the aid and, and, or the funding that they allocate, that they distribute goes to multilateral organizations and then secondly, NGOs. We're not, it's, it's not clear from this graphic whether those NGOs are international NGOs or local NGOs. And then there are other, um, the public sector is one of them as well, but it's, it's, it's much less so. And then private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we tend to uh, gravitate towards NGOs. Again, not explicit here whether these, and these are international NGOs or local NGOs. If we um, recall the grant bargain agreement signed at the um, humanitarian summit, in 2016, there was a commitment to start shifting power and start shifting funds to local organizations. But we see that that is far from uh, being met. There was a, a goal of 25% of funding to go towards uh, local organizations. And unfortunately, that has been uh, more of a downward, downward trend. Um, and, and what you're seeing on the screen are the, the amounts in 2019. So if, if, you know, according to the Global Humanitarian Assistance Report that was published in 2020, uh, international humanitarian assistance sent direct, directly to local and national actors um, has been decreasing. So it went from, uh, uh, from being, uh, one, 134 million in 2018 to 110 million in 2019. So it is uh, decreasing and it's not, it's a concerning trend. However, we all know that 2020 was a year of change. And, um, you know, for, the, for good or bad, you know, the, the humanitarian sector reached a tipping point in 2020. Um, it was a year that was highlighted not only by the pandemic, but, you know, which continues to impact the world today, um, but, you know, protracted nature of conflict, um, the, the increasing impact of cyclones, hurricanes. We had a very active season last year, floods, drought in the Sahel, um, so climate change impact. And then on top of all of that, the world was shaken by the systemic racism um, that we've seen in the United States, but that has made the world reflect about how we, you know, equity and, and, and what we're doing uh, along those lines. So the year 2020 also was the year for that tipping uh, to take place in the sense that it made us more aware the importance that how important it is to invest on, on local actors. 
So to address the question, um, and, and, and what I'll do is that I'll, I'll be brief because we'll be discussing a little bit more later. I'll address by, the question by, by uh, giving you three basic reasons of why it's important to invest in local actors. And by local actors at the Belinda and the Gates Foundation, we look at the multi-stakeholders that are part of that ecosystem, that national ecosystem, that state ecosystem. And in the case of our team, we look at the humanitarian or disaster risk management. And if we want to have stronger systems, stronger communities, we really need to invest in those uh, local actors, the public sector, private sector, local NGOs, uh, civil society organizations, um, the academia. So all of, all of them play a role. And um, by investing in them, we go to the second reason why it's important to invest in local actors, and that is ownership. We've all heard and seen um, how, unfortunately, um, there is this um, kind of like overpower of INGOs sometimes that come and um, somewhat impose sometimes um, solutions on, on, uh, on countries or, or the places where they're working. And we learned from the Ebola outbreak, for example, that community engagement was a big piece that was missing. It was really difficult at some point to get that um, Ebola under control to, to try to disseminate the right information, the cultural context of the information. So in that sense, um, when, when processes, when approaches are based on local actors, there's ownership from the start and by, by that, you're strengthening the systems. And last but not least, sustainability. So at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, we strongly believe that as, as donors, we have, have to act responsible, responsibly by making sure that the projects that we're funding, the programs that we're funding have a sustained impact, sustained uh, life beyond our funding. Funders, you know, private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we don't fund things in perpetuity. We need to make sure that strong systems are rooted on, uh, on, on the, the local ecosystem and sustainability is built in. And that's uh, something that can be done from the ground uh, with the interaction and the participation of the different stakeholders the local stakeholders. Uh, we believe that um, in order to have sustained uh, humanitarian action, you need, you know, governments need to take part and a private sector and all of the stakeholders. I wanna read a quote um, from uh, something that I was just, you know, it was before, after actually I finished my presentation, I was in a conversation with someone from Oxfam, America, and she shared a quote uh, from uh, written by Martha Bekele from Oxfam. I'm sorry, as about something she wrote for development initiatives. And this is based on some work that she did with Oxfam in Kenya and other uh, organizations. And it reads like this. Localist, localization is not about empowering local actors to carry out solely humanitarian responses. Capacity strengthening must shift from firefighting to sustainability with a focus on linking long-term resilience and development programs. Ultimately, the aim should be breaking down the wall that divides the humanitarian and development sectors. So what this means to, to the foundation and, and to our team and, and to all of us who are uh, so concerned about you know, the, the shifts and, and we wanna see um, more traction. And, and at the foundation, we say we're impatient optimists. We want things to happen faster because we can continue to separate development and, and humanitarian action. Um, every time a, a country uh, takes some steps forward in development, and is confronted with a shock, 
with an emergency, with a crisis, that development takes several steps back, steps back. So by having stronger systems with all of the stakeholders involved, uh, sitting at the decision-making table, um, we believe that that, that nexus, that, that, um, hu that humanitarian and development sectors will strengthen each other and will have more resilient uh, communities. Um, I, I wanna go back to, to Mandela's quote uh, because, and remembering also um, Dagan's quote in the sense that we need to act and, and we need to act responsibly and we need to act quickly. Um, it, this is not just having a vision of what the nice thing to do is, but really putting actions uh, into place, the strategy into place, because we can change the world, not only from the donor's perspective, uh, but also uh, the local actors themselves by taking the place that they deserve uh, to have. So um, with that, I think I am gonna stop here because I know that there are other, um, other presenters. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Ms. Pilar Pacheco of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's really heartwarming to know that the funder and international organizations such as yourself believes in the power of localization. So building resilience, local ownership, and sustainability are the main factors so that we can really help achieve resilience at the local level. Now, I would from moving from uh, this topic, I would like to move on to the nexus between the government and local uh, non-government organizations at the grassroots level. How are their capacities being strengthened? And let me just address this question to Mr. Irfan Mufti uh, to respond for his uh, remarks on this presentation. Mr. Irfan. And thank you, Edwin. And I think Ms. Pilar has really set up a very good a theoretical foundation for, for me to take forward. Uh, I come from a totally different uh, background, which is basically community action. And uh, what Ms. Ms. Pillar was saying is actually how to translate into, into grassroots action is something that we, have, we are trying um, uh, here in Pakistan. Uh, so my presentation is actually uh, is covering the aspect that how we are trying to make it possible, how the localization uh, um, is, is working in, in, in a real setting. So um, if, you, if you just go to the next slide, this is where you see our, our vision comes from it, that local capacities and action are the sustainable solution to humanitarian crisis. I think this is what we believe on. And, and, and I'm so glad that uh, ADPC, Asian Preparation Partnership Friends are there, and they are really helping us to do that. So uh, in just three, four years that we, we see the results are coming in. Um, if you go to the next one, uh, you see the, that uh, we have a national platform, which is called Humanit National Humanitarian Network. We formed it in 2010 after a, a big uh, uh, flash flood, which hit almost 30% of the population of the country. And then we realized that uh, this is not possible to wait for international organizations to come forward and help us and help communities and villages down there in, um, in, in remote areas and in hilly areas or in deserts. So we better have to come up with some local solutions. So we formed this national humanitarian network. And now there are 180 plus local organizations, national organizations, and different other actors who, are, who have joined this platform. Uh, and the purpose is very clear that we want to make sure that there, there are timely and accountable humanitarian responses. And that is where NHN uh, has the most uh, um, uh, investment made and um, there's a mix of all kinds of factors, um, 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 uh, community organization, humanitarian experts, institutions, ac academics, and all of those are now are joining the National Humanitarian Network. So this is where we started. We started with a platform and we try, started uh, understanding the need. We started understanding the, the situation, doing the, the analysis. And then if you go to the next one, uh, we... Uh, uh, the next slide, please. Um, yeah, 
so we, we the country we have we, this is a country of perpetual humanitarian situation there are floods there, we have been facing drought cycles we have been facing all kinds of displacements because of the uh, war on terror because of the other humanitarian crises so we live in a perpetual humanitarian situation and that is that is not possible to respond to those situation by waiting for external help all the time so we we need to have uh, something a kind of a local uh, architecture through which we can we make sure that the, the, the response is there, the response is timely, response is, is well-meaning, and also it, 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 it sustains till the, till the action is needed. So this is Pakistan. Pakistan is in, in a perpetual disaster situation. Next, please. Uh, uh, now, what strategy we have adopted? Uh, we have adopted from response, immediate response to resilience. Uh, now we are into preparedness uh, uh, mode. We, we want to make it possible that it's not that we will be wait for another cycle of disaster to come in. Rather, we, we, we are doing better preparedness for uh, for future. And there, the, the, the real investment is coming. And thanks to APP for providing us leverage uh, for, for preparedness strategy. And that is, that is really helping us all uh, uh, big times. Transferring capacity. We don't believe on building capacity. We believe on transferring capacities from one actor to the other, from one stakeholder to the other. So more interaction means better uh, capacities. Uh, and that therefore the, the, the platform works very, very uh, effectively by, uh, by actually creating space for interaction and joint actions. And therefore, the, the, the transferring of capacities take place. And then praxis of practitioners. We try to put different stakeholders into different situations and we try that they should do the action, they should do the learning and they should come back with more lessons and then they should do this, then, then, uh, the be better planning. So we are creating the, 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 the communities of practices, practitioners, and there they are really helping each other, building up a strong uh, resilience and preparedness uh, uh, methodologies and then broadening partnership, bringing other stakeholders together, and that that is really helping us all time. And um, visibility and knowledge building, and therefore we 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 are trying that whatever little we we learn, we should we, we should expand it, we should replicate it, and we should transfer it to others. Next, please. Uh, if you look at the, the the current architecture that we have, of course, the Asia Preparedness Partnership (APP), which is a larger Asia level uh, multi-country uh, platform through which we share knowledge, we share techniques, we share uh, lessons, we share um, uh, skills, and then at the country level, we have we have created a resilience partnership, which is which is which is an umbrella platform in which government. Uh, chairs along with NHN, we we both co-chair this uh, this platform, and then the, we have uh, other CSOs, part of his humanitarian actors, government institutions, media, business leaders, academicians, and now rescue services are also joining us. So a larger national level platform called uh, Resilient, and that brings all the key stakeholders together, and then. At the local level is a humanitarian network, which is primarily CBOs, community organizers, humanitarian activists. So we, so if you look at this pyramid, you will find that we are trying to to bring down knowledge and technical assistance uh, and and funding to the from the uh, the top level to the to the grassroots, and then from the grassroots up, we we we, we try that we should we we should generate new skills, new ideas, and new knowledge. So this is the way this, this uh, pyramid function at the moment. Uh, if you go to the next one, and that is where we say local is the solution. We don't believe on, on solution from outside. So that is where we are building up. So if you look at the past, there was a human, weak humanitarian sector. There were weak linkages. There were uh, the, the country, uh, the partnership was very net and nascent. I, I'm talking about four or five years back. And now if you look at the, the current situation, you'll find growing partnership, um, uh, ownership of the, of the agenda, of the resilience agenda. Uh, and then, of course, it's not just the practitioners who are joining together. It's the academicians, it's the researchers. Uh, there are the experts who can bring a different kind of a knowledge on the table for others to, 
to understand and, and, and grapple with. And then resilience agenda is getting the center, uh, the center stage. So this is, I think this is, if you go to the next one, this, you see the approach is to create an institutionalized joint action and collaboration. Create institution, uh, institutions which can bring in all kinds of uh, skills, knowledge, and then ability to, to, to act together. And that, that is really working quite well. So this is resilience partnership that we, we, have, we, we are working on. If you go to the next one, um, uh, uh, yeah. So lesson, what are the lessons we have learned? Uh, it's timely response. Uh, local stakeholders take the lead uh, and they prioritize actions. Then the ownership comes, start coming up and ownership is not just on, on, the, on the agenda, but ownership on the action and the results too. And the local actions also reduce cost. And uh, that is where we are working on. We don't need much money to, to plan. We, we plan regularly and that is where the strength comes in. Mm -hmm. And then trust building. Trust is, is essential here. And in the past, we, there were some trust deficits. Uh, INGOs helping local NGOs, but they were all the time, they were questioning each other and they were doubting the agenda and they were doubting the, 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 the financial uh, distribution, but no, no more. Now they, they, they sit together and they know each, what exactly the, the, the role um, they, they or the other they expect. So that's the, 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 the if you go to the next one, uh, some, some other lessons, if you look at the different stakeholders, they also, and this is, these are the lessons that they themselves have, have articulated. They say, like the, um, the government says that uh, the, uh, the key to success is engagement, is bringing together the, the partnership. And similarly, local NGOs also recognize the role uh, of uh, management systems, government and international NGOs. If you go to the next slide, uh, you will find that the media is also uh, finding it so good to to that they, they think that they can mainstream the successes and academicians also. So these, if you so, what my key lesson here is that by doing so in uh, creating localized capacity solutions and leadership can really bring better, timely and res and uh, accountable responses uh, in humanity and also preparedness. Um, plans. This is what exactly for the future. My last slide. Um, uh, best way forward: cultivate mutually supporting action, fostering spaces for local solutions, prioritize local agenda, funding people-based solutions, and putting partnership between local and NGO is the center of the local localization. That these are the future that we are building up. Thank you very much. This was all uh, coming from a very practitioner's view. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Irfan Mufti, for that very insightful presentation, especially on how the government can work with local non-government organizations at the grassroots level. You mentioned a key point here, which also ties in neatly with what Ms. Pilar Pacheco said, that ownership for local solutions is important, especially in terms of identifying the needs at the local level and then transferring the capacities and learning. Now, from the moment that we are speaking about localization, we now move to our private sector representative. And I would like to ask Ms. Veronica Gobaldon, how does the private sector actually take the lead in terms of humanitarian action, both in terms of disasters and with the current pandemic that's happening right now? Ms. Veronica Gobaldon? Good day to you, Edwin, and thank you very much for having me here and uh, a warm uh, welcome to our uh, participants as well. The private sector, uh, the role of the private sector has often been um, discussed and um, mentioned uh, when it comes to disaster risk reduction management. But um, the question is, um, what, what will it take and, and how can it be done? Uh, for the private sector to be or to play a crucial role in DRR. Allow me to give uh, some examples from our organization. PDRF is a um, DRR-focused organization. We are a nonprofit um, uh, 
um, agency and in the private sector focus, we are a network of business um, businesses with a unifying vision to build the disaster resilience of communities and businesses. Let me share my screen right now. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's coming up. Yes, all right. So PDRF is a network of businesses with a unifying vision to build the disaster resilience of communities and businesses. Our approach toward this goal is to work with all stakeholders in all the society working across the phases of DRR from preparedness, response, rehabilitation, recovery, and mitigation. We organize our member companies according to their core competencies and build an ecosystem toward disaster resilience, which no single organization can build on its own. You have to be a part of a network of people, organizations, and government agencies working together towards disaster resilience. The PDRF cluster system allows for seamless interoperability between the government and the private sector, even the United Nations. This partnership will go beyond response, but is further strengthened during peacetime as we engage in capacity building activities, such as training, exercises, and planning sessions to improve response capabilities. We operate an emergency operations center and um, at the heart of our operations center is a GIS based platform called HANDA or Hazard and Disaster Analysis for Business Resilience. HANDA is the core of our information management, management system in the PDRF operation system. It, we also work across all phases of the disaster risk management. And during peacetime, we focus on capacity building programs, raising awareness on business continuity, planning, building an ecosystem of resilience in different sectors, which could translate to reduction of social economic impact brought about by a disastrous event. We also provide support to the government agencies. We have co-developed the public service continuity planning program, the Office of Civil Defense. This joint effort led to the development of a standard public service continuity plan for all government agencies. This is to ensure continuity of essential functions of government. This development and promotion since our program started in 2016. And when the pandemic hit last year, we've seen the vulnerability of the MSME sector and how they greatly affect, they were greatly affected. With the support of the APP Philippine Preparedness Partnership, we have been able to continue and further strengthen our initiatives from them and also for the MSME program developers through the following, providing these um, information, manage, information materials, production of infomercials in local languages and conducting webinars, and also um, helping them on the digital shift, providing them with mentoring. And most importantly, we were able to develop a, an uh, MSME guidebook launched in 2019, which has been disseminated nationwide. And as we continue with APP this year, some of our uh, pipeline uh, programs include uh, more on the BCP or the business continuity planning for the MSMEs and uh, modules to be uh, updated in our IADAP or online digital uh, platform, e-learning platform. And um, just to give an example of how we have been uh, helping in the fighting this pandemic in April, the government launched Task Force T3 or Test Trade Street, a public-private partnership between government's interagency task force, the Department of Health, the Asian Development Bank, the Philippine and several dozen private uh, organizations. And its goal is to help wrap up the government's testing, tracing, and treatment efforts to beat COVID-19. To date, the coalition has accomplished so much by ramping up the country's overall testing capacity, established one hospital command composed of private and public hospitals to manage hospital bed capacity to accommodate COVID patients and help the government establish isolation facilities, facilitate local manufacturing of PPEs. And um, recently, we are now focused on the vaccine rollout and established collaboration of government and private hospitals, healthcare workers, and providers to work together. Private sector has a crucial, crucial role to play in uh, humanitarian action. It is essential to strengthening the disaster resilience of the country. We need to work to together. 
And that is why PDRF works in the premise that a strong multi-sectoral collaboration drive DRR at all levels. And this collaborative form of engagement allows us to participate in policy formulation, establishing standards and sharing private sector expertise. Thank you and over to you, Edwin. Thank you very much, Ms. Veronica Gabaldon for sharing with us the private public partnerships initiatives here in the Philippines. And what I really got from your presentation is that there's needed pooling of resources of companies because there's strength in numbers. And that's the reason why it's important to complement and supplement the DRR efforts by the government. I also heard that you are focusing on the micro, small, and medium enterprises that are adversely affected by disasters, including the current COVID-19 pandemic. I hope that you will continue on with the private sector initiatives on supporting local communities recover from disasters. And we're very fortunate that coming from the private sector, we are also joined here today by a dignitary from the government sector who will talk about the standing order on disaster 2019 or SOD19 of Bangladesh. And I would like to pose this question to Mr. Muhammad Mosin. How does this SOD 2019 of Bangladesh actually promote multi-stakeholder approach for locally-led actions? Mr. Mosin, the floor is yours. One is muted. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes, we can. Okay. Sir Masin. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Bangladesh. As you see, Her Ex Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, has unveiled standing orders on disasters 2019 in October 2020. She's also the chair of Climate Vulnerable Forum. It means CVF, which is comprised of the 20 most climate vulnerable countries across the globe. As per SOD, Standing Orders on Disasters, Honorable Prime Minister leads the highest level committee of Bangladesh of Bangladesh, namely National Disaster Management Council. You see here uh, another very remarkable uh, uh, photo of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And he has always been a great inspiration for disaster risk management. In 1972, it means 50 years back, he established Cyclone Preparedness Program, CPP, which is acknowledged as a global breast practice. And you'll be happy to know that we have 74,000 volunteers and among them, 50% are women. And you see, our father of the nation, at that time, he really, he emphasized on the Local, locally led actions. And this is the context of our country. You see here, Bangladesh, the largest delta, having vast flat plains, which hundreds of rivers and tributaries in densely populated, where 1,116 people are living per square kilometer and due to climate induced and seismic hazards, Bangladesh is one of the most disaster prone countries in the world. As we see in this slide, our country is ranked as the seventh most affected country by extreme weather events between 1999 to 2018. It is according to the 
uh, German was global climate risk in this. So this is the context of our country. In this slide, you see that Bangladesh formulated several policy frameworks, such as Disaster Management Act 2012, in approved by the parliament, Disaster Management Policy 2015, National Plan for Disaster Management, you know, 2015, uh, it is, you know, in the year of uh, 2000, now is going on 2021 to 2025, and standing orders on disasters which have been already mentioned. And then we have Delta Plan 2100, and as well as we have the National Building Code, it is very much related uh, with the disaster. That is why I want to mention here. And then among all these, you know, the, the policies, we are updating these policies on a regular basis. And among them, I want to emphasize SOD, Standing Orders on Disaster, is the most important document for effective implementation of Disaster Management Act. In this slide, you see, highlights the history of SOD, Standing Orders on Disasters. Originally, Standing Orders was prepared only for cyclone in 1985. And then, following the spirit of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, father of the nation, Standing Orders evolved, covering all types of disasters. And the first comprehensive SOD was launched in 1997 under the leadership of his worthy daughter, existing Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And it was updated in 2010 and subsequently in 2019. And considering the international disaster risk reduction strategies and national perspective, perspectives. If you see the Sendai framework we have in 2015 and then Hyagu framework 2005, but we are lucky enough that we have the standing orders in 1985 and then the latest one in 19, uh, 2019. And then I want to mention the key features of the standing orders of disasters. It includes 16 national level and 18 local level disaster management committees. That is very important. As well as SOD elaborates details, roles and functions in all phases of disaster cycle, cyclone. It means the preparedness, and that in the disaster time and the after disaster event to promote the whole of society approach. SOD also involves 55 ministries. It means all the ministries uh, of our country with relevant departments, UN and development partners, as well as the private sectors and the NGOs and other stakeholders. So it improves all. This slide is so the whole of society approach of the of the disaster risk management. Volunteers are integral part of this approach, especially who are acting as first time defense in the community. We have five million volunteers from different organizations working throughout the country which is a key strength of the success of disaster risk management in our country. You see here, I mentioned, I don't mention the name, BNCC, VDP, and then Scouts, and then Urban, and then other, and then Flood Preparedness Program even. And here you see, this is the mechanism of currently functioning 
standing orders on disasters and engaging stakeholders. And disaster management committees are formed with representations from all relevant stakeholders, from local to central level. And at the field level, volunteers from the community work as the extended force of disaster management committees. It is worth mentioning 50% of the volunteers are women that ensures a gender responsive approach in disaster risk management. Then you see, SOD supports effective and inclusive planning towards risk reduction, response preparedness, early warning, evacuation, humanitarian response, and recovery within the community. And all this create collective impact in reducing loss of lives and protecting assets and livelihoods for building a resilient nation. Thus, the disaster risk management played a critical role for LDC's graduation of our country. I think this is the last slide from my part. You see, Bangladesh is recognized as the role model of disaster risk management, which was also reflected in the words of former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2019. He mentioned Bangladesh is the best teacher to learn from about adaptation and disaster management. And as well as we can say, we are the rule model in case of this. Uh, I think my time over. So this was all from me. Thank you all for your patience hearing and over to uh, uh, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad Mosin, sir, for your wonderful presentation. And we're happy and congratulations to Bangladesh for being recognized as a role model in disaster risk management. You highlighted the important role that the government plays in terms of setting up policies that will provide an enabling environment for multi-stakeholder approach to encourage locally led actions. I'm actually touched when you said that you are promoting volunteerism in Bangladesh and with SOD 2019, more than 50% of your volunteers are women. So there's actually gender balance with regard to your volunteer program. Congratulations, sir. And we look forward to hearing updates with regard to your policies and implementation in Bangladesh so that we can learn more from your country and organization as we move forward with our own initiatives at the local level. And now, moving on at the regional level, level again, coming from our experiences in Pakistan, the Philippines, and Bangladesh, let us move on to the regional level. I would like to ask Mr. Sisera Madura Peruma of ADPC to respond to this question. How can regional organizations promote localization through regional cooperation and global outreach? Mr. Sisera, please. Thank you, Edwin. Well, I think all the previous speakers made my life much easier because they discuss, you know, their country specific model. And we heard from Pillar about, you know, development partners point of view. Irfan talk about civil society and local organizations. And then we heard from our Philippine colleagues about the private sector engagement. And then obviously Mr. Mosin talked about how SODs promote whole society approach. So as a regional organization, regional intergovernmental organization, I'll, I'm going to share the story of Asian Preparedness Partnership, but this is not the only model. There are a number of regional organizations and regional models. Perhaps this is one of the models that we all can uh, learn from and perhaps can continue to improve on. Uh, well, I like to bring your attention to the slide that Pillar talked a while ago. You know, since when we look at the humanitarian, direct humanitarian funding coming to the local actors since 2015, or even you can go beyond that, but if you look at uh, the latest global humanitarian assessment report released on 2020, when we look at the 
uh, direct humanitarian funding coming to local actors, namely national government, local and national NGOs, national societies, and other local actors. It has been stagnated around 3%, right, for last five years, last four to five years. And in fact, in 2019, it was a little bit reduced also. It has, uh, it has been reduced to 2.1%. So how should we move ahead in this particular scenario? Well, one option is keep complaining. Another option is to look for alternatives, right? Look for positive uh, contributions into this whole ecosystem. So as, as an intergovernmental organization, as a uh, regional model or regional partnerships, APP as a regional partnership, we thought of moving forward in a more positive contribution rather than complaining more, because this is what it is and this is how it is for the last four or five years. And uh, although there were promises and uh, discussions to bring these contributions into 20 to 25% for local direct humanitarian fund into local actors, but you know we are, we are in 2021 now, and we are still at 2.5, sorry, 2.1 percent. So in that context, uh, ADPC and APP took a different path to mobilize like-minded partners and like-minded countries to develop a model that can positively contribute for transformation, human transformation of humanitarian ecosystem. Uh, we started with working with governments, local NGO networks and the private sector networks. And some of the networks are already in this discussion, right? PDRF and the government of Bangladesh and then NHN from Pakistan and so on and so forth. But obviously we work with multiple other countries. And in fact, we redefine the localization uh, process and the terminology. You know, earlier part of the humanitarian dialogue, it is start that localization is all about bringing the local organizations into the humanitarian ecosystem, right? But we redefine or we, we refine the terminology of localization. When I say we, it's basically APP, it's a multi-stakeholder partner, multi-country, multi-stakeholder partnership. So they redefine the localization as a process of which local, subnational, and national humanitarian actors, namely, the governments, civil society and non-government organizations, the private sector, media, and academia, et cetera, taking a lead role. These are the keywords, right? On the other hand, this talk about the whole society approach that Mr. Mosin was talking about. So bringing all these organizations together, but they take the lead, not someone else. So lead role is one of the key words, but not in a competitive manner not in an arrogant manner, but more on a collaborative manner. So we are not in a race with international humanitarian organization or funding agencies on this dialogue or this ecosystem. Rather, it's collaboration, rather it's a partnerships. We believe that there is a role for local organization as well as international organization. So while local organizations take that whole society approach and leading role, they can also collaborate with other partners to plan and implement priority actions in disaster preparedness. I mean, overall resilience, not necessarily on humanitarian response, but also on disaster preparedness, humanitarian response and recovery through mobilizing internal resources. Asia is not poor. We don't believe that Asia is poor. And for that matter, I'm sure it is, it is the same argument for Africa and other part of the world. And we are not poor, but they do have internal resources and obviously, they would be able to leverage external humanitarian funding also. So the whole philosophy of localization within APP is basically whole society approach, taking the lead role by the local actors in a collaborative manner, but also mobilizing their own internal resources and also supplementing and leverage from external resources. Uh, what would APP or any regional model can do? perhaps increase locally led action to prepare for response and to recover from disasters in high risk countries. Obviously, Asia Pacific region is quite vast, right? So we may need to prioritize our interventions and finite amount of uh, resources to have a better response, right? So we, we do work in high risk countries, which are, which are you know, exposed to climate extreme as well as other natural disasters. And you know, investing on those countries to increase their capacity 
to have locally led actions to prepare for and respond to disasters. The, the second point that I like to highlight is basically institutionalize efficient and cost effective innovative approaches for locally led actions. You know, as I mentioned, we don't have much resources, right? I mean, we do have our own resources, but international humanitarian ecosystem, I show you the figures. So we need to bring efficient and cost effective solutions. And solutions may not be with ADPC, perhaps. It may not be with uh, big humanitarian NGOs. It may not be with UN. It may not be with academia. Perhaps it might be in a small village or Upasila in Bangladesh, or it might be in Barangay in the Philippines, or it might be in a village in the Pakistan. So how could we mobilize and promote as a regional model to bring those cost-effective and innovative solutions and approaches to upscale, uh, scale out and scale up uh, uh, humanitarian response and DRR interventions? That's another area that ADPC or any other regional organization can invest and can work on. The third part, you know, is strengthening, enabling environment. You know, this will not happen in autopilot. Humanitarian transformation will not happen in autopilot. It needs a lot of push and pull. It needs a lot of dialogues, policy dialogues, advocacy, humanitarian dialogues. In, in fact, even this uh, humanitarian leadership components, you know, these kind of components is required for us to change the way that we all work. So, you know, as a regional model, strengthening enabling environment for humanitarian ecosystem transformation through regional corporations and global outreach and advocacy. That is another role any regional organization or model or partnership can play. And, uh, you know, Global South, you know, obviously APP focus only on Asia, but, you know, it can apply in other regions as well. We started six countries, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, Myanmar, Cambodia, and the Philippines. And in the APP plus model, Bangladesh and Lao PD are also chipping and they are in the process of establishing Bangladesh preparedness partnership or what we call BPP, for example. You know, these like-minded countries, you know, if, if there is a role model in Bangladesh, you know, there are many other countries can learn from that. If Philippine private sector engagement is a role model, other countries can learn from it. If civil society engagement is a role model in Pakistan, other countries can learn from it, right? So being a regional organization, bringing these good practices, success stories and upscale and it's, you know, uh, bringing these success stories to other countries and region is, is, uh, is an area where regional organization can, can play a key role. And we're ahead. APP has to acclimatize ourselves with other regional frameworks. For example, APP has defined and refined our strategy in line with Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and sustainable development goals, as well as national policies, strategies, programs, and so on and so forth. And then APP, APP countries define seven dimensions of change for localizations. And these are kind of, you know, uh, uh, enabling factors, if I put in that way. There are seven conditions that we are working towards. One is policy enablers. As Mr. Moshin mentioned, there are n number of policies at the country levels to support and facilitate DRR processes. Likewise, there are n number of policies and procedures within, within the donor community, within the regional organizations such as SARC, within region, regional organizations like ASEAN, right? So the regional organizations and model like APP can support member countries and state to develop, improve, revise their existing policies, procedures, strategies, and so on and so forth. And then the partnerships, bringing the whole society approach at the country level, but also whole society approach at the regional level, whole society approach at the global level. Perhaps organizations like ADPC and APP can play a big role in that process. The capacity building, not necessarily on technical side of disaster response or emergency response, but also institutional capacity built into making sure that they have their uh, you know, appropriate auditing process, their due diligence process are in place, right? Their operational manuals are in place and so on and so forth. So capacity building is one of the area which regional organizations can play and knowledge sharing and consolidation, knowledge curations, disseminations and innovations 
I will not go into detail innovations because I have one more slide on that. And the humanitarian transformation, humanitarian ecosystem transformation. We don't want to see another 10 years with 2% 2 direct humanitarian funding for local organization. We need to uh, you know, continue to discuss and have a dialogue with our development partners and humanitarian organizations to make this process a bit transparent and a uh, uh, bit more towards local organizations and the sustainability, obviously, you know, looking at uh, what Pillar also discussed earlier. And South-South cooperation and global outreach, organizations like APP, partnerships like APP can play a big role in terms of dissemination tools, training, publications, success stories, resources, you name it. So we do have something called One Stop Knowledge Hub called APP Knowledge Portal. I would request all the colleagues to access into and if there are any knowledge product that you would like to share, for example, if there are success stories in Bangladesh, perhaps APP can be a conduit to share those success stories in the rest of the world. And the last but not least, innovations. As I mentioned earlier, it's a critical element and I'm very glad to inform that ADPC is going to launch a social innovations grand challenge on the 5th of next month, 5th of May. And I like to invite all the practitioners and partners, those who are attending this conference to log into. This is a free webinar. And some of the knowledge products, some of the assessment report that we have developed uh, will be launched along with the social innovations grant challenge for the APP member countries. Because we believe that humanitarian ecosystem really need innovations as we move forward. Over to you, Edwin, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cicero Maduro Peruma for your presentation. Uh, it's quite unnerving to know that there's lessening direct funding to local and national actors, as you have mentioned in your presentation. But thank you for sharing the journey of the Asian Preparedness Partnership. I hope that we will be able to learn from one another as we move forward. And I actually heard you saying that local action must be taken in a lead role, in a collaborative manner. And we hope that the government, the private sector, local NGOs, academe, and media will be able to work together in many countries, not only in Asia, to promote local resilience, especially to those affected communities. So thank you again for that. So now I would like to pose this question to all of you, our dear five panelists. And I would like you to reflect on, please, what are the main gaps, barriers, and challenges to localization? And when you respond to that, what do you think are the measures that can be done to address these gaps, barriers, and challenges? Anyone who, who wish to start our discussion? I'm looking at Ms. Pilar Pacheco. What do you think? Sure. Actually, I, can, I was going to volunteer for that. Um, I think um, there are a couple of things. So as a, as a funder, I think we, you know, we have a responsibility. Um, and, and, and I think it has to do with how do we simplify processes? How do we um, you know, reduce the burden of this overly complicated administrative uh, process to access funding? So um, I, I think that's, a barrier. I think that's something that funders need to work on um, in general. I, you know, I am, I, I am hopeful because, um, for example, I'm part of, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we're part of a cohort of U.S.-based private foundations that we're wanting to learn from each other and uh, we want to be able to co-fund together and so the conversation among funders is happening, that all of that rhetoric about decolonizing aid, I believe that, you know, many funders are taking steps to making that happen. It's, it's not always very easy. You know, we do have to comply with certain um, requirements by law, but I think we just need to think critically about how to simplify the process. So I would say that's one challenge on the funding part. And the other one is, and, and recently uh, we held, our team held a webinar with our partners 
and we addressed uh, this issue of uh, local actors. So one of the one of the barriers that our partners, both INGOs and local partners, talked about is that lack of political will by historically dominant humanitarian actors. And, you know, and, and many INGO partners that were part of that conversation were, were reflecting on their own role of, you know, always having this, there is that, there's that entrenched attitude that international actors know more or that have the capacity. And, you know, although that could be true in some cases, there are certainly um, many, many cases where uh, the local actor actually has more knowledge and they have the capacity. So it's more about capacity sharing, capacity transfer, um, and, and not just, you know, just the capacity building part. So I think it has to do with um, political will in a way. And uh, from the donor's perspective, how to, how to simplify processes. And uh, it has to do with um, how do we shift power and resources? Uh, and by that, you know, because the resources, the funding, of course, uh, play a big role. And there are ways in which INGOs can, can simplify that, donors can simplify that. But when I mean, what I mean by uh, shifting the power is how can we all ensure that local actors are sitting at the table? So for example, one thing that I really value in APP is that within each country, actors, the local, the multiple stakeholders are sitting at the table. So it's not just the government alone. The government is acknowledging that you need civil society organizations, local NGOs, because sometimes the local NGOs are located in places where the government doesn't reach. And you need to involve the private sector and the academia. So just uh, enabling the environment for the local actors to sit at the decision-making table. And in that sense, um, INGOs and also funders, um, for example, something that we're doing at the foundation is that we're encouraging our uh, partners to, our INGO partners to really partner on the ground during our response with local organizations. And we're collecting that information. So I'll stop there to let others uh, Way in. Thank you, Pilar. I think, Ms. Pilar Pacheco, I think you have wonderfully elaborated on certain problems like access to funding, technical knowledge, and being able to sit in the table, especially for local actors. And when it comes to resources yes. and that access, I think it's also key that we ask Mr. Irfan Mufti for his insights on this issue because, you know, local actors, the NGOs, I think, would be the farthest. In the table. So, Mr. Irfan, what do you think? Thank you, Edwin. Um, I think um, um, Mr. Sisira and Ms. Ms. Bilai, uh, Bilar has already covered a bit of it. There are some systemic challenges and there are some challenges for, for really galvanizing the local support uh, and, 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 and assistance. There, there are two, two or three different levels of challenges. One is, of course, the, 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 system, the system challenge, the language. Uh, the formats, the, how to approach, where to approach, how to write, all of this. I mean, you have to simplify. You have to make it more easier for community practitioners to understand. I mean, very cumbersome procedures by international NGOs, by funders. And I think there we really need to work quite ex extensively to make it uh, simpler uh, and easy to handle. That's that's where, and uh, I'm glad that Cecilia has already mentioned, and APP is actually doing it. It's it's really symbolizing the simplification of procedures and language. That that is, I think, that's the one measure. On the other level, where the the, the you know the real action take place, the uh, the joint action take place. I think there are two three issues that we really constantly face. One is the trust deficit. Whether stakeholders really trust each other, whether they actually understand the needs and capacities and skills of each other, and they really respect the contribution to each other. I think that is where the trust needs to be enhanced. 
And that is where the whole approach of uh, creating spaces for, for action, um, uh, planning and decision making really work quite well. So if you just create a system of, uh, uh, or institutionalized approach of joint planning and joint uh, collab and collaborative action, I think that would really help here. Similarly, uh, you see the patience is needed. You cannot have, um, uh, you see, a tree grown in, in just a few days of, uh, after seeding. You have to really nurture it. You have to water it. You have to, you you, you have to really uh, put your efforts into it before you really you expect some fruits coming out of it. So the patience is needed. So what I'm feeling that the NGOs and and funders are really getting uh, uh, somewhere uh, 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 impatient to get the results. Just just hold on. I think this is a, a decades of deficit of skills and knowledge and 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 trust. And if you really want to build it, just just keep keep of nurturing it, keep supporting it. That is where uh, the ultimate result will come. For example, let me let me give you an example in in Pakistan Resilience Partnership. We have brought in uh, um, business leaders. We have brought in community leaders. We have brought in uh, even rescue services, government uh, disaster management authority. So all these very varied level of stakeholders coming together, probably the first time in in the in the the, uh, the, the lifespan. So this is where you are gradually bringing the culture of discussion, culture of sharing, culture of uh, understanding each other, and then culture of planning together. So this is, I think, there are several challenges ahead, but uh, the measures must come from with the approach and vision that it must strengthen the local and not empower the, the external. So this is this is what I, I believe. And PRP, Pakistan Resilient Partnership, and APP is, are really helping us doing it and achieving these results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Irfan, for sharing your local insights with regard to this question on the gaps with regard to localization. And you mentioned the systemic challenges to be addressed in simplification and the trust deficit needs to be built on, you know, trust building exercises for all local partners. Um, you know, for our dear speakers right now, disasters do not impact people equally. We know that there are more vulnerable groups compared to others. So I would like to pose this question to the rest of our panelists. How do we now ensure that we leave no one behind? I think that's the buzzword for now. With regard to our local humanitarian efforts, how do we ensure that we bring them to our fold uh, when we do local actions? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Ms. Gabaldon on this one. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Edwin, for that question. Um, PDRF pushes for policies that involves the private sector and other stakeholders in the decision-making process and uh, in the implementation of PRR programs and activities. And uh, currently PDRF um, have, uh, are, is part of the council at the local level and we are engaged with the National uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council, as well as the UN humanitarian country team and lastly, the MSME Resilience Core Group. It is because we need to capacitate ourselves also to make sure that we understand uh, the different stakeholders uh, that we encounter or that we assist um, when disaster strikes. Being part of a uh, multi-sectoral multi platform such as APP ensure that we get guidance in uh, incorporating humanitarian principles in our programs and um, activities. And uh, we are also investing in uh, training and uh, staff development within our organization in GBV and other uh, principles to make sure that when we develop, when we design programs, we make sure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Veronica. I think those um, initiatives by the private sector in the Philippines highlighting your experiences at PDRF really ensures that we leave no one behind. And now from the government side, Mr. Muhammad Musin, sir, could you give us your insights with regard to this question on how we do not leave uh, anyone behind in our local efforts? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Admin. I want to start in this way. Empowerment of engagement of the community are really critical pathways 
to support no one, uh, leave no one behind principle in the disaster risk management, in the humanitarian efforts. I can, uh, such as example, Bangladesh is one of the pioneers for promoting the promoting and implementing the inclusive disaster risk management in alignment with Sendai framework and the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, as well as the convention of the rights of persons with disabilities, such as our disaster management related policy, plans and guidelines, and especially the SOD are supportive for ensuring leaving no one behind concept. Even in the COVID-19, I want to mention here, the response and recovery, inclusion of persons with disabilities, women, children, senior citizens have been ensured. As well as in case of the cyclone and the flood shelters are constructed, keeping in mind disability and gender issues, ensuring accessibility and segregated facilities. These facilities allow more people to take shelters during emergency situations and to save lives and assets from disasters, from disaster. And I want to mention again that the, uh, and around uh, 5 million volunteers are also contributing to implement the quick local level humanitarian actors. So actually, finally, the empowerment and engagement of the community you know, it's very important to support, leave no one behind principle. Thank you very much, Admin. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Mosin, you mentioned gender issues, focusing on the most vulnerable, and of course, working at the community level to ensure that the resilience is really built from the bottom up. I think that is very inspiring coming from a dignitary from the government sector. So it's really a role model for Bangladesh to take the lead on disaster risk reduction and management efforts. Uh, Mr. Sisira Maduro Peruma, would you like to chime in as well on this issue? Uh, sir, you are on mute. Sorry. So I like to bring. Um... Uh, attention into another side, specifically during COVID, right? And most of the discussions, dialogue, and engagement at the national, regional, and global levels happen through virtual means, online means. But that itself is basically a big challenge for us to see that how, how, and you know, what are the existing tools and solutions to engage with local actors, especially. Uh, you know, the at-risk communities, especially in the situations where there are restrictions and COVID-related restrictions and so on and so forth. So I, I believe that uh, as a partnerships or as a country-specific chapter, finding those solutions, you know, making sure that frontline functionaries are involved uh, into the dialogues. And, you know, we've been working with some of the member states and countries to make sure that their communications and, you know, their, their ways of engage engagement are improved, not only looking at the health side of the pandemic prevention, but also, you know, the engagement side is quite important because with the restricted movement, with the, uh, you know, uh, health concerns in place, there is a high, high chance that we might not be able to meet that conditions, you know, without, without addressing some of these tools and without some of addressing some of these engagement related solutions. So I would like everyone to give emphasis on those engagement tools and see whether there are new ways of engaging with that risk communities in the middle of a pandemic, since we don't have that physical access as we used to have. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. And, you know, as you mentioned, we do not need to be socially distant with one another while we are practicing physical distancing. We do not leave anyone behind because there are engagement tools that we can use. And of course, the APP platform can help you on that. So for our dear participants out there, you may visit our website for more information. I do not want to leave you, Mr. Cicera. I would like to pose another question directly for you. And why with the context of the climate change right now, because it's not just the sudden onset disasters, with climate change posing a great threat to our way of living nowadays, how can local-led actions address this and its impact? What do you think, sir? 
Thank you, Edwin. Uh, well, you know, most of the countries, the government, the policymakers talk about net zero emission by 2050, right? So mo most of the emphasis are on the climate mitigation side. But on the other hand, if we look at the local actors and at risk communities, in fact, they are the, especially in this part of the world, they are the least contributors to climate change. But on the other hand, considering the fact that they are the at-risk communities, although they are the least contributors, but they are the worst, uh, you know, they will get affected worse, right, compared to the emitters. So in that case, I would say that, uh, you know, two aspects. One is that extreme events, you know, be it flood, be it cyclone, be it, you know, drought, you know, these at-risk communities and local actors will get impacted from climate change. So, what could they do? Perhaps our existing solutions, our ex existing strategies, coping mechanisms may not be enough to withstand with the climate wonders uh, that may that may come in the next couple of years. So, you know, re revisiting their existing coping capacities to see whether these are big enough or these are strong enough to withstand with these climate wonders is one area that perhaps they could look into. The, the other part is the adaptations, which is going beyond, you know, uh, facing the extreme event, but also looking at their agriculture practices, their livelihoods, you know, uh, their, you know, employments and all other elements of their day-to-day -day lives and see whether they can, how they can adapt to, you know, while the government and policymakers are focusing on net zero uh, emission by 2050 and looking at, you know, uh, big, big contributions for em emission reductions. But I believe that partnerships like APP and local organizations and chapters in this APP and similar the other similar models can play a big and active role uh, in adaptation to the climate change, specifically at the local level, because adaptation is all about local actions. Perhaps this is area where APP and other partners may want to think how APP can expand its horizons to make sure that our interventions are climate sensitive and they also can take certain actions at the local level for adaptation to climate change. Over to you, Edwin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cicero. I think you hit it on the head that local action is needed for climate change adaptation and mitigation. I'm seeing uh, Ms. Pilar Pacheco, would you like to chime in as well? Yes, thank you. I, the thing is that, you know, because as funders, we're tracking, you know, all the time um, the behavior or the impact that um, climate change is having on disasters. And this is where we feel that local actors are more relevant than ever. And I wanna to touch on what uh, Cicera mentioned and, and some other speakers as well, which is that uh, knowledge sharing, learning from each other. I think there's just so much richness on the global South. Um, so many actors doing you know, very innovative approaches or in the case, for example, of Central America, Central America, you know, has all of these uh, floods and hurricanes, and then it goes through extensive periods of drought, you know, much like Pakistan and much like Africa, the Sahel. So uh, something that they're doing, the local organizations have organized, and they're working with the communities to, um, to bring back traditional for, uh, forms of farming. Um, they're, you know, bringing back in indigenous farming techniques, adapting them to the look to the context of today and the climate change context. So, for example, that's what, how I think um, sharing information, sharing knowledge is critical and uh, local actors in the case of NGOs working with governments as well um, to to address the climate change and adapt uh, to the needs of today. Um, you know, it's not just about uh, being, being ready to respond, but how do you work on preparedness? So that's something that, you know, external actors are not gonna do. Local actors need to work on that, you know, prior to having the, the shock of, of the, the crisis, in this case, drought or hurricanes or whatever it is. So preparedness is a big um, part of, of local actors, how, how they, can, they, they can address uh, climate change preparedness response and then be able to bring, you know, bounce back uh, quicker. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Pilar. I think you hit it on the head as well when you said the traditional forms and indigenous knowledge do not necessarily need to contradict our scientific data. And we can go back to this uh, cultural norms to help us address the impacts of climate change. Now for the interest of time, and I know that we have a lot to say and share with our participants, but let me ask our five dear uh, speakers, our distinguished panel of experts to please, just in maybe a minute or so, what is your main message, the key message that you think our participants must remember from this APP session? To wrap up this, let me start off again with you, Ms. Pilar. Sure. I have a twofold message. I think for donors, we need to take risks. We need to move to action. We need to simplify process and, and you know, really walk the talk. Um, you know, if, if we're saying that we believe in localization, really uh, diversify our pool of partners, our grantees, and make our processes easier. And then to local actors, it's take your place at the table. Don't just wait for someone to give you the space. Uh, it's your right, it's your, it's your place, and you uh, have the, the capacities and knowledge that are required to, to be part, fully part of, of processes and, and being involved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pilar. So take part in the discussion. Mr. Irfan Mufti, your final message, please. Well, thank you, uh, Edwin. I think I'll endorse the, 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 the mission uh, statement of the, of the conference. And it says that developing and improving leadership in humanitarian system. I think this, is, this should be the core message here. Develop the leadership. Develop the local leadership. I think that is where the real... Uh, action will come and the sustainable action will come. So my message is that more that we invest in the local, more we invest in terms of the partnership and develop and transferring uh, capacities, I think that is what this uh, will bring the, the real solution for future. So this is my message, develop local leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irfan. Not only building leadership, you said, transfer of skills and knowledge is important. So, Miss Veronica Gabaldon, your key message, please. Disaster resilience can only be achieved if the community is resilient. And that is in PDRL, capacity building at the community level. And, and how do we do that? Uh, we build their um, resilience by giving them, uh, teaching them uh, with uh, um, the, the ways of uh, preparing their families and their community. We also bring in our um, lifeline companies, the experts in the private sector to also give them insights on how to prepare. And so in that kind of environment of working together, when disaster happens, and we know that disaster is local, they are the frontliners, they are the first responders. And by capacitating them in that manner, they will be able to you know, um, respond accordingly. And um, organizations like PDRF can only go there and augment whenever uh, they are, you know, um, when, when when they are already done with uh, what they have uh, with all their resources. So community resilience is important if we want to build uh, the nation's disaster resilience. Thank you very much, Ms. Veronica Gabaldon. So building community resilience is important and all of us here today in this conference, we will support that. Uh, how about Mr. Mohamed Mosin, sir? Your yes. final message. Yes, very brief. We need more innovative, comprehensive and scientific approach for local humanitarian actions. And I want to mention again, again, finally, whole of society approach is very important in enhancing locally led preparedness and humanitarian response. Thank you very much, Admin. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad Mosin, sir. I like your idea of whole society approach. That is also something that we are proud of here in the Philippines. And finally, Mr. Cesira Madura Peruma. Yeah, Edwin, uh, while I'm endorsing all the opinions from other distinguished speakers, I would like to suggest that 
it is it is really good to be optimistic but also be realistic you know this humanitarian ecosystem might not change within a day or two it might take you know five years decades or maybe several decades so let's be realistic and keep our engagement ever ever engage as we move forward or what you had been Thank you very much. Optimistic and yet realistic. So thank you very much again for our five distinguished panel of experts for participating today and sharing your insights and experiences to our participants. And to our dear participants, we hope that you had a great time listening and learning from our speakers. And we will look forward to meeting you again in our network session. Enjoy your stay at the 2021 Human Leadership Conference. Thank you. And we're signing out. Good day, stay safe and well.